Let me begin our pre-conference uh, experience today by turning your attention to a text in the Gospel according to St. Matthew, in the twelfth chapter, beginning at verse 15. But when Jesus knew it, He withdrew from there, and great multitudes followed Him, and He healed them all. And yet He warned them not to make Him known, that it might be fulfilled what was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he will declare justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel nor cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoking flax he will not quench, till he sends forth justice to victory and in His name Gentiles will trust." In the early days of prison fellowship, I was a member of the board of directors that met regularly in Washington, D.C., and on one occasion I was having dinner with the leader, Chuck Colson, and he turned to me and he said, R.C., he said, we need to design a logo for our ministry. Do you have any ideas? And I didn't hesitate. I said, Chuck, the first thing that comes to my mind is the passage in Scripture, a bruised reed will he not break. I had been with Chuck in prisons and had seen how he ministered to people on the inside and realized that many of us as Christians have a somewhat Pollyannish view of ministry to prison inmates, thinking that almost all of these poor folks on the inside are uh, victims of society and just need a little bit of encouragement when in fact on the inside of Maximus Security Prison are men and at times women who are so hardened of heart, vicious in their behavior, that uh, when you leave those places you're glad that there are walls between them and yourself. On the other hand, there are multitudes behind bars who are indeed bruised reeds. And when we talked about this, that was the logo that uh, Chuck selected for that ministry and has been used ever since. You've perhaps seen the lapel button with the stalk of wheat that is bent over but not broken. And how that applies to our subject today, I think, is this. When we look at how Jesus dealt with people, and dealt with people with whom He had at times profound disagreements, I think we can learn something from His demeanor in these episodes. Some of you recall several years ago when John Stott and wrote a book entitled, Christ the Controversialist. It seemed that everywhere Jesus went, He found Himself in the middle of controversy. But I notice one distinct difference between Jesus and the former manager of the New York Giants, Leo DeRocher. On one occasion when the lip, as he was known, 
was interviewed about his managerial style, he said that his philosophy in managing was to treat every player the same. And when I heard that, I thought, that's not a very good manager. Unless what he means is that everybody has to play by the same rules, and then, of course, all players have to be treated the same. But as human beings, we differ from person to person, and some people respond by tender words of encouragement where other people need stronger admonition in order to respond. And though I don't wear a bracelet that says, what would Jesus do, because I'm uh, acutely aware that there are many things that Jesus would have done in His lifetime that I could never emulate because it would be wrong for me to try to repeat His actions because He was the mediator and I'm not. Yet at the same time, we are at, at a, another level called of God to imitate Christ. And so there are many things that Jesus did from which we find an example that I believe is normative for proper behavior. Look at Jesus as the Good Shepherd. Look at Jesus and how tender He was to the lambs. He would never break a bruised lamb. And yet the Good Shepherd, as we see in the Old Testament, is one who had not only a staff, but also a rod, because it was the responsibility of the shepherd not only to nurture the sheep, but also to protect them from ravenous wolves. And so you see Jesus as the Good Shepherd encountering people with whom he disagreed. But you notice that when he meets the woman at the well who had had five husbands and whose lifestyle was one with whom Jesus profoundly disagreed, and when you see Jesus meeting the woman who was caught in adultery and made a public spectacle, who was engaged in a behavior that Jesus strictly prohibited and denounced as sin, yet you see the unbelievable sensitivity and kindness that comes from Him just in the way He addresses these people. The fact that He called them women, He said woman, which was a title of respect in His day. He didn't say to the woman caught in adultery, listen, harlot, but rather He called her woman. And the same with the woman at the well. Because Jesus saw in these sinners people whose weakness was something that needed encouragement and love. That's not how Jesus dealt with the Pharisees and with the scribes, with whom He also had profound disagreement. When He dealt with the scribes and the Pharisees, Jesus asked no quarter and gave none. He denounced them publicly with the ancient form of the oracle that was the form used by Old Testament prophets when He pronounced the judgment of God upon them, saying, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You go over land and sea to make one convert, and after you made him, you make him twice the child of hell, then you are uh, yourselves. And so, we see not an inconsistency, but a diversity in how Jesus dealt with His adversaries. Now, I know our subject is how we are to deal with differences that we have 
with our brothers. But we also have to add to that this, not only dis disagreements that we have with our brothers, but also disagreements that we have with those who claim to be our brothers, but who may in fact be wolves in sheep's clothing. Because beloved, there really are wolves out there. And those wolves always represent a clear and present danger to the safety, to the health, and the well-being of Christ's sheep. Now, I think to know the difference between when to be gentle and when to be forceful is one of the most difficult matters for a mature Christian to discern. And I don't have a formula for you that will be easily applied. But I do know that in all of these occasions, we are called to deal in the disputes and disagreements we have on the basis of charity or on the basis of love. Now, I'd like to read a portion. I, I, I know it's not uh, uh, homiletically correct to read things from books to people when you're speaking, but I can't say this as well as this man says it. And so, if I can just beg your indulgence for a moment, I'd like to read uh, a few words, and then I'll tell you from where they are. Humility tends to prevent a willful and stubborn behavior. They that are under the influence of a humble spirit will not set up their own will either in public or private affairs. They will not be stiff and inflexible and insist that everything must go according to what they happen first to propose and manifest a disposition by no means to be easy, but to make all the difficulty they can and to make others uneasy as well as themselves and to prevent anything being done with quietness if it is not according to their own mind and will. They are not as some that the Apostle Peter describes, presumptuous and self-willed, always bent on carrying their own points, and if this can't be done, then bent on opposing and annoying others. On the contrary, humility disposes men to be of a yielding spirit to others, ready for the sake of peace and to gratify others to comply in many things with their inclinations, and to yield to their judgments wherein they are not inconsistent with truth and holiness. A truly humble man is inflexible in nothing. Let me say that again. A truly humble man is inflexible in nothing. It's not the end of the sentence. Except in the cause of his Lord and Master, which is the cause of truth and virtue. In this he is inflexible because God and conscience require it. But in things of lesser moment, which do not involve his principles as a follower of Christ, and in things that concern only his private interests, he is apt to yield to others. These are the sentiments of the New England divine Jonathan Edwards. I count this book, Charity and His Fruits, one of the top ten books I've ever read or studied in my life. I've read this book at least five times, probably more. And I keep learning from it because I think it's the deepest exposition of 1 Corinthians 13 I've read anywhere. 
And I don't know why I keep coming back to it, because I must be a glutton for punishment, because every time I subject myself to the standard of love that Paul sets before us in 1 Corinthians 13, the standard it says, love does not seek its own. Love is not puffed up. Love is patient. Love is kind. And all of the things that he says that love is and isn't, I'm looking for another chapter of the Bible to go and study because I find that I'm slain before the norm of agape love. But the humility of which Edwards is speaking here is a humility that must be brought to every difference and disagreement that erupts among believers. And it is a humility that brings to the fray what we have called in church history the judgment of charity. Let's talk about that for a minute, the judgment of charity. The judgment of charity is the judgment of love. The judgment of charity works something like this, that when we disagree with one another, I believe that I am called as a Christian to bend over backwards to assume the best of all possible motives in your heart for our disagreement. A few years ago at one of these conferences, in fact twice we've done pre-conference seminars where we discussed the, the whole issue, for example, of infant baptism, where on one occasion I gave the case for infant baptism, and John MacArthur gave the case against it. Another time, I gave the case for it, Alistair Begg gave the case against it. And in those discussions, I think one of the things that came across, and at least I hope that it came across, was this, that we disagreed on what was pleasing to God with respect to the administration of this sacrament with respect to who should receive it. And we also, but we agreed on several things. We agreed that both sides could not be right. So that one of us at least was doing something in the practice of the church that in the final analysis would not be pleasing to God, or somebody was not doing something in the life of the church that would be pleasing to God if they did it. But the assumption was, in our discussion, was that both sides wanted to do what was right. And we were trusting each other's commitment to the things of God. And we granted on the out, on, at the very beginning of that particular discussion that the New Testament nowhere gives an explicit command to baptize babies, nor does it give an explicit command or prohibition against baptizing babies. So that whatever side you come down on, you have to build your case on inferences drawn from the text, on implications from the text, and that's where the discussion goes through the ages and through the centuries where great minds disagree on this sort of thing, and we say to each other, somebody's right, somebody's wrong, but at least we recognize that both are trying to be faithful to Scripture. If you don't believe in infant baptism, for example, what you should do sometime is go to people that you respect and ask them why they do. And if you don't, and if you do believe in infant baptism, you need to sometimes sit down and ask somebody whose judgment you respect why they don't believe in it. I used to teach uh, Systematic Theology three in the seminary, and the seminary was, had half the students were 
uh, Presbyterian or, or Episcopalian, the other half were Baptists. We come to the senior year, second semester, Systematic Theology three, Church and Sacraments. In the middle of that semester, I had to teach the doctrine of baptism. And half of my students were Baptists getting ready to be ordained. I said, what do I do if I persuade these guys of infant baptism? I'm destroying their careers. You know, it was a terrible, terrible thing. So I dodged the issue this way. <laughs> What I did was that I made every student who came out of a tradition that practiced infant baptism to write a paper on the case against infant baptism, and made all of those who were opposed to infant baptism write a paper on the case for infant baptism, so at least they'd begin to see why they, they differed from their brothers. Now. The judgment of charity assumes in a Christian dispute that the brother or sister with whom we're disagreeing are disagreeing honestly and with personal integrity. Like I, John, John MacArthur, I've always said about John MacArthur, if I disagree with something of, with John MacArthur, I don't care what it is, and we go to the mat and we talk about it. I know this about John MacArthur, that if I can persuade John MacArthur that the Bible teaches what he does not believe, that John MacArthur will that moment change his position, no matter what it costs him. Because what he wants more than anything else is to be faithful to the Word of God. Now that's, that's what I mean by the judgment of charity. You don't impugn people's motives, and don't assume the worst of their motives when we find that we're in disagreement with them. We make a distinction between best-case analysis and worst-case analysis. The problem we have as converted sinners who are still sinners is that we tend to reserve best-case analysis to our own motives, okay, and give worst-case analysis to our brothers' and sisters' motives. And that's just the opposite of the spirit we're called to have in terms of biblical humility, isn't it? I was in an ecclesiastical meeting the other day where a matter was being discussed and not really debated, just discussed regarding different forms of worship. And I stood there and listened to the discussion, being quite aware that the position that I hold myself was 180 degrees different from what was being presented in this meeting. And when the time came to discuss it and to have questions about it, I didn't say a word. One of the ministers who was in the meeting during the time of questioning raised his hand and, and uh, expressed a real uh, struggle that he was having in his church and in his congregation where he said a couple of my elders are struggling with our worship leaders being on the stage. What do you think about that? And the speaker responded to it and everything. And I had some thoughts go through my mind, but I didn't utter them. And when I got home, I had to look at myself in the mirror, and I looked at myself and I said, self, Why didn't you say something? What I wanted to say was I wanted to raise my hand and say, did you hear this minister of the gospel just publicly refer to the chancel of his church as a stage without blushing? I wanted to say, doesn't that give 
anybody pause? Then we're talking about the sanctuary of the house of God as a stage? I didn't say it. So I said to myself, self, why didn't you say it? So what I tried to do was to explore my own motives. And at first, I applied the judgment of charity <laughs> to myself. I said, well, the reason I didn't say anything was that I didn't want to create any kind of uh, problem here in this meeting and, 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 and voice a negative view that would be unpopular and stir up controversy. There's enough of that in the church today. I don't need to say that. That was my first answer to myself. My second answer to myself was the reason I didn't say anything was because I thought it was futile because that battle's over and lost anyway, and no matter what I say isn't going to change it. And so I just thought I'll check out of this discussion. Then the third possible motive I thought was You just want everybody to like you, and you didn't say anything because you're a coward. Now, did I stay quiet because I'm humble, or did I stay quiet because I'm a chicken? I don't know. It's not always easy to know, is it? It's also extremely difficult to know when an issue is so serious that it demands debate and whether the issue is so non-serious that debate becomes harmful. Here it means how do we discern between major or minor issues or between what we call essential and non-essential matters. And again, at times it seems like the difference here between right and wrong, beloved, is a razor's edge. Take the Apostle Paul, for example. How many times does the Apostle Paul, in setting forth before us what godly behavior requires, what it means to manifest the fruit of the Spirit, which fruit includes such things as love and patience and long-suffering and so on, and the opposite vices against these virtues are being quarrelsome, contentious, contentious, divisive, always fighting at the drop of a hat over every point of disagreement. The Old Testament tells us the fool is always in a hurry to express his opinion. And so Paul says a Christian is not to be marked by a spirit of contentiousness, by a belligerent, bellicose, warlike attitude that can't wait for the next theological battle to come down the road. In other words, there's a stress in the New Testament on patience and tolerance within the church rather than creating strife unnecessarily and a party spirit within the house of God. Yet at the same time, the Apostle Paul would write to these people that he's instructing not to be contentious, things like this, oh foolish Galatians. Who has bewitched you? 
I can't believe how quickly you've moved away from the gospel to another gospel. I can't believe how quickly you've compromised the central message of the Christian church, and there's Peter out there doing it, and Barnabas, and he's naming names. Do you realize how politically incorrect that was? He said, I had to rebuke Peter to his face because he was caving in to the Judaizers. And what Paul was saying in Galatians, as I read him, is we're not to fight over every point of disagreement, but at the same time, we are never, ever, ever to tolerate the intolerable. And the negotiation of the gospel was utterly intolerable to the Apostle Paul. Now, beloved, we are in what has been called the age of relativism. And relativism is so saturating our culture that it is rubbing off on us and on the church. You know what I hear all the time from people? Doctrine divides. So we should never get into discussions or debates about doctrine. What counts are relationships. Well, you see, if there's, if there's no doctrine, then there's no truth. And if there's no truth, there's no Christ, who is the incarnation of truth. At least two-thirds of the New Testament is devoted to doctrine. In His wisdom, God was very much concerned that we receive sound doctrine, and we not heap to ourselves teachers with itchy ears, or who say, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. Before he died, Francis Schaeffer said that in our times, we have lost the concept of antithesis. An antithesis is the opposite or the contrary to the thesis. Now, here's what I found out among Christians. If I ask you, what do you believe? And you say, well, I believe this, 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 and this. And I say, that's cool. And I'm glad to hear you publicly declaring that you believe that. But will you deny its antithesis? Oh, no, you know. I don't want to do that because that would get me in trouble with somebody else. But, beloved, you cannot affirm the positive aspects and, and assertions of Christianity without at the same time denying their antitheses. Ian Murray wrote a book that dropped like a bombshell last year in the Christian world entitled Evangelicals Divided or Divided Evangelicals. What was the title, Sinclair? Evangelicalism Divided, in which he traces the history of American and British evangelicalism and their movement, a gradual movement away from antithesis, where you can no longer draw lines in the sand and say, that position is not Christian. There's no such thing as heresy anymore because we have lost, either lost our nerve or we've lost our minds, maybe a little bit 
of both. I heard a professor give a magnificent address once on the occasion of Jesus' encounter with the Syrophoenician woman. Now, it's in that encounter that maybe uh, Jesus wasn't quite as sensitive as uh, He was to the woman at the well. You remember the Syrophoenician woman who wanted His attention, and Jesus said, you know, He can't send uh, His, his uh, things to dogs, and, and uh, called her a dog by inference. And she immediately filed a petition with now. <laughs> now, instead, she looked at him and said, yes, Lord. Can you believe that? He basically calls her a dog, and she says, yes, Lord. But even the dogs eat the crumbs from the master's table. Well, this professor was trying to explain all of that because he introduced his message by saying that he had heard a message recently from a woman evangelical scholar who was saying that in this particular episode and in this encounter, Jesus violated that woman's integrity, insulted her without just cause, and in fact sinned against her. And so the purpose of his address was to defend Jesus from the charge of this professor that Jesus had violated this woman in his discussion with her. And I had an opportunity to speak with him later. I said, you know, I've just, I thought your, your, your address was magnificent, but I just have one little question. And he says, what's that? I said, why did you refer to that lady scholar as an evangelical? Why didn't you call her a professed evangelical or something like that? But how can somebody be an evangelical Christian and deny the sinlessness of Jesus Christ? There are wolves out there, folks, and they will devour the sheep. And there are times when we have to take them on. Now, if we're arguing with them for the sake of our own egos, or that we can win an argument and show how smart we are, then shame on us. But there are times in every generation, in every Christian culture, where the essential truths of the Christian faith call for war, for theological controversy that just won't go away. I hate conflict. And frankly, the pattern of my life, any psychologist that knows me will tell you, is that I'm almost addicted to conflict avoidance. When a person is involved in conflict, they have two possible options, fight or flight. I prefer to flee. Yet I keep finding myself in fights, I mean, but most of them are in the theological arena, everywhere else I'm fleeing. But it is not an easy matter to discern when you debate and when you demur or just be quiet. But when people claim to be evangelicals, and at the same time deny classic theism, it's time to argue. When people seek to correct, not just interpret, but to correct the teaching of sacred Scripture, it's time to say no and to debate. And we are here today because our fathers and our mothers have spilled their blood for the sake of the truths that we hold so dear. It's hard because we're not supposed to add an offense to the gospel. 
And I can add offense to the gospel by just being personally obnoxious, arrogant, rude, impatient. And then when people get mad at me, I can say, well, they're just falling all over the rock of offense. It's Christ they're really mad at, not me. When in fact, they're responding that way because I've added offense to the gospel. Now, we have to be as careful as we know how to be not to add offense to the gospel. Remember Paul said, the Gentiles blaspheme because of us. On the other hand, beloved, don't you ever, ever try to take away from the offense of the gospel. Because if you remove the offense of the gospel, you remove the gospel. Because the offense of the gospel is Christ Himself. And without Him, we have no gospel. And so my charge to you is to walk that razor's edge carefully, prayerfully, but courageously. Let's pray. Our Father, help us to be quick to offer the judgment of charity, but to recognize the difference between the judgment of charity and the judgment of naivete. Help us to be extremely patient with your sheaves, your sheep, but to be bold against the wolves that would devour them. And God, help us to be able to discern the difference. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen.